Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to BIC Streams. Bangalore International Center, or BIC for short, is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, and the arts. This evening's session is titled Heritage, History, and Beyond, Railway Buildings of the Raj. In this book, in his book, Indian Railway Buildings, Vinu N. Mathur reveals interesting and little known aspects of the heritage railway buildings of India, such as the Bengal Nagpur Railway House, which is the oldest and one of the finest classic mm -hmm. buildings of the Indian railways, and is said to have been home to Nawab Wajid Ali Shah of Awadh while he was in exile in Garden Reach, Kolkata. The session will cover railway heritage in general and railway buildings and architecture in particular. The presentation includes the influence of changing architectural styles adopted at the time, such as classical revival, Romanesque revival, Gothic revival, and the indoor Sarsenic. It covers a range of building types, like stations, general offices, railway institutes, training establishments, and bungalows, and highlights the contribution of princely states, styles adopted by individual railway companies, and cites the influence of individual architects. After a brief introduction to different facets of railway heritage by the panel, consisting of Sir Mark Tolley, journalist and former bureau chief of BBC, New Delhi, Divay Gupta, heritage con conservation and management expert, and the secretary of Rail Enthusiast Society, Mr. J.L. Singh. Vinu Mathur will make a presentation on the development of railway architecture during the century from 1853 to 1953. If you have any questions, comments, or observations to share with the panel, please uh, feel free to use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and uh, the panel will address them towards the end of the session. And uh, for the full bios of the panelists, please look to the chat box, which is also at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now I'd like to invite Sir Mark to do the introductions. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Vinu, particularly for asking me to join this session, because um, as you know, I'm a great admirer of all that you have done for heritage. Um, I'm a great admirer of that wonderful book you wrote on Northern Railway Bridges. And um, I am a railway enthusiast and uh, also an architecture enthusiast too. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, and I just briefly want to say two or three things about heritage and then one or two about the book. Um, but first of all, about heritage. Heritage has now become one of those words which is on everyone's lips. But unfortunately, what is on people's lips uh, doesn't seem uh, to be as easy to get that translated into action. But heritage to me is um, hugely important because uh, it not only um, reminds us of how people lived in the past, um, but above, uh, perhaps more important than that, um, it, what it does is it makes us realize um, how much life has changed and how much we need to preserve uh, what we have of the past in order that we can uh, live our lives um, with respect for conservation or conservatism, with not a political conservatism, for uh, realizing that uh, we must not live in an era of butchering or um, destruction of monuments, destruction of institutions. We must uh, respect the past, learn from the past, and indeed, I believe, uh, love the past as well. And I, I therefore think that um, heritage is uh, absolutely vital. And in India, we have the privilege of having lots and lots of monuments which need to be preserved. 
lots and lots of other things which need to be preserved too. And the railways are obviously an important source of those. And any of those, any of you who have seen Avino's book on the bridges of the Northern Railway, uh, you will realize um, what sort of heritage there is just in the bridges alone. But if you think of it, the railways, of course, the bridges were important. There would be no railways without bridges, or not many railways without bridges, anyhow. Um, but uh, the railways, uh, from tickets to uh, the names of railways, to the stations of railways, to the history of railway travellers, and so on. Uh, railways uh, involved us, and they still do involve us, in uh, far more than just monuments or bridges or that. Not that those are not important, but they're all part of a great scheme, a wonderful system, and that wonderful system we need to preserve in all different uh, aspects of it. I uh, go back to Britain usually once a year, and I find in Britain, and I travel in Britain quite often, I just uh, come back from a, a couple of months ago, and I traveled on one of the preserved railways there. And one of my pleas in India is that we should start having these preserved railways as well, because it's, it's a wonderful form of heritage. Um, but uh, Vino has chosen to uh, write about architecture, um, which is, of course, a very important part of heritage. And um, architecture itself, of course, then brings us to things of the people who use the architecture um, and how the architecture has changed, if it has changed over the years. And all leads uh, to a sense of um, belonging to the railways, which I personally think is, is very important. Um, and that if we can get people to feel that they are belonging to the railways, then they will preserve the railways and they will try and find ways of preserving them and finding ways of modernizing them. Uh, very briefly, uh, I would just add to one point, and that is that I do worry about railway architecture in particular, with all this talk about uh, commercializing stations, rebuilding stations, and that sort of thing, because with that could come terrible damage. And I just hope that uh, this book um, and other efforts by Dino and others of us uh, will be able to preserve um, the beautiful, wonderful railway heritage. So now I uh, um, hand you over to the next um, speaker, um, and uh, well, I will, as Dino has done in his book, say, I hope you will love this book as much as I do. Thank you, thank you. That was wonderful. And uh, I, I mean, I don't need to say much after what you already raised all the important points, but uh, just to add my two pennies, um, I also agree with you completely that the, in, especially in today's context of great rapid development and need for maybe improvement in facilities, there definitely is an opportunity for redevelopment. But I think in that redevelopment or so-called monetization, we should not forget that these buildings and iconic uh, sites of the railway buildings are much uh, of heritage nature. And I think both development and heritage conservation can go together as uh, uh, two sides of the same coin. 
So uh, I feel that, yes, I completely agree with you that we need to be cautious when we are redeveloping these. They are not like normal re real estate greenfield developments. They are uh, of heritage nature. And I think due diligence should be done when we are redeveloping. And I think a great example of it comes out from uh, UK, which is the King Cross railway station, where they have retained both the old and also redeveloped, um, uh, or uh, has also redeveloped and made it very, very modern. And having said that, I think, I hope this book will really open this dialogue as well as this opportunity, because while we do all feel a very fascinated and very emotional about her railway heritage, but there has been no compilation. So there was a huge gap in our information and understanding on what really are the kind of typologies of the railway heritage in, in this country. And I'm very happy that uh, Vinuji has brought this uh, book, which very interestingly does not only focus on the railway stations. It talks about the headquarters, it talks about clubs, it talks about even iconic sites like uh, CST, but also small residential buildings and hutmans or including large settlements like Jamalpur uh, as well. So which also shows us the kind of diversity and variety of uh, the railway heritage and we, which we tend to only focus uh, on the railway stations uh, particularly. Of course, uh, I'm sure there are many more than the 180 sites that uh, Vinuji has uh, covered, and we are hoping that he will come up with the uh, volume two of his book covering many other uh, the bridges and many things. In fact, I know of two examples that are not featured in the book. Is one uh, railway station, uh, I think, close to Savai Madhapur, which actually doubles up like a water tank. And uh, the, uh, which is a very interesting building, which is on top of this entire railway station is a huge water tank, which actually used to supply water, not only to the railways, but also to the town. And at the site is the salt gola, where all the salt that was collected was uh, in India was collected in near to Havra, was actually stored there before it was shipped or uh, because the salt was actually uh, a commodity which was controlled by the British. So many, many more examples I hope uh, we have at Intech been struggling, sorry to say, with trying to restore some of these um, buildings like the Salt Gola, uh, the Northern Railways headquarters, even some of the museum displays in the Rail Museum. Uh, but with very limited efforts, we were able to intervene a little bit in the CST. So perhaps uh, I hope that this book will uh, open those doors and with Mr. J.L. Singh also the Railway Enthusiast Society, they will be able to use their good offices and really impressing upon the railways to surely move forward, but move forward taking along the past. With that, I thank you and uh, invite Mr. Singh to say his few words. Thank you, sir. See, the railways in India are now 170 years old. We were the 12th country in the world to have a railway, the first in Asia and the first outside North America and Europe. So with this 170 year history, we do, uh, we do have a lot of heritage and we do have a lot of history at our disposal. What makes this heritage in our country a little more special? The first is that we've had we have a variety of terrains. We have a variety of climates. We have different types of uh, railway companies. We have private companies. We had government companies. We had the princely state railways. All this has led to a very rich and very varied heritage, much more than any other average country, perhaps even big countries like the USA. To give you one example, we've had as many as seven gauges in our country. Mm. Four gauges are easy to recognize, the broad gauge, which is now most widespread in India. We have the meter gauge, which is one meter. We have two narrow gauges. Mm -hmm. One is two foot six inches and one is two feet. We've also got a zero foot gauge. Wow. By zero foot gauge, I mean a mono, mono rail. Mm -hmm. It existed in Patiala 
and yeah. you can see today at the National Rail Museum in Delhi. Mm. Then at in at Nehati in the eastern part of India, we had a four foot gauge. It doesn't exist anymore, but that very well known locomotive, the Ram Gotti, ran on narrow on four foot gauge when it first came. Today, a lot of the metros are uh, adopting standard gauge. The standard gauge, which is there in Europe and North America, four foot eight and a half inches. So with so you can understand that with seven types, seven different gauges, all the other things like locomotives and coaches and wagons and tracks and bridges and everything will also vary and be different. Anyway, when we say railway heritage, what exactly are we talking about? First, of course, we are talking about the fixed structures, the track, the bridges, the tunnels, the stations, the buildings, the colonies, the workshops, signals, they're all fixed structures. Some of this is over 100 years old. Many of our bridges and tunnels are as old as the railways. Mm. For example, the tunnels which take you from Bombay to Pune or from Mumbai to Nasik were all built in the 1860s. So these are all very old and they still exist. Of course, many of these came later, but they're all part of our heritage. Then there's the rolling stock, locomotives, coaches, wagons, cranes, uh, different types of trolleys. They're also part of our heritage and heritage also means how they evolved. Then there are various records, books, drawings, documents, which exist. But what is very interesting, which normally we tend to overlook when we talk of heritage, is the intangible heritage. Heritage, which is like the kind of uh, work methods we had, the kind of means that we had, the kind of people who ran the railways. A lot of this intangible heritage has come to us through records and books, but a lot of it has come to us through, spoke, through the spoken word, through traditions. So when we talk of heritage, we should include all these heritages and not, although today we're talking about buildings, but all these are also part of railway heritage. Unfortunately, the average railwayman is not a real enthusiast. So after retirement, uh, I, along with a few of other like-minded people like Vinu Mathura is one of them, we got together and set up a society called the Rail Enthusiast Society. This is a new society. We were registered only in December 2015. And uh, we, uh, we call ourselves a society of rail enthusiasts, by rail, rail enthusiasts, and for rail enthusiasts. It is probably one platform for rail enthusiasts in India where we can exchange ideas, air our views, and see what we can do, not only for railway heritage, but for rail enthusiasm and rail fanning in general. One of our main activities is bringing out a quarterly magazine. I think the main task this magazine is doing is that we are documenting a lot of things which would otherwise have been lost. Although not the primary purpose of the magazine, but history and heritage form something like 40 to 50% of each of our magazines. Thus, a lot of aspects of our history and heritage are being documented. We have already published 23 magazines and we hope to reach over 100 uh, in the not too distant future. So a lot of history and heritage is being recorded in these magazines. Last year, we went into the publishing of books. We have only published one book till now. It is Black Beauties by Vikas Singh, who is one of our founding members. This book has photographically documented all steam locomotives that existed in India in 2021. Now this locomotive could be working, it could be standing on a pedestal, or it could be a derelict in one of the old sugar plants of India. We have recorded, this book records each and every locomotive. At best, we probably missed about half a dozen locomotives. So therefore, whatever happens to these locomotives in the future, it is now documented that in 2021, these locomotives existed in India, where they are and what their condition is. Then we are also trying our best to help the railways to identify rail heritage. See, a rail, a rail enthusiast who may not be a rail woman, I would say about 40% of our membership is not rail women. They see different aspects of the railway, which probably a working rail woman does not. Recently, we have an example. The Karnak Bandha Bridge in Mumbai is due for demolition. One of our members was able to talk to the railway authorities and remove some of the building plaques of this bridge and get them transferred to the heritage gully at the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj terminus. So this is the kind of help which we are doing. 
uh, help the railways identify items of railway heritage, and then assist them in getting them to museums or uh, preserving them in some other way. I only hope that this uh, slight consciousness of heritage, which is coming up now in the railways, will continue. A few years back, we did not have uh, anybody looking specifically after heritage in the Ministry of Railways. But today we do. We have an executive director who is looking after heritage. So I hope this looking after heritage and taking care of it continues. And we are able to preserve the very rich and very varied heritage that the railways has. Thank you very much. Now I would like to hand over to the main speaker of the day, Mr. Vinu Mathur. Um, good evening, friends. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, uh, being here today to talk to you. I'd first of all like to thank the Bangalore uh, International Center for inviting us uh, for this particular panel discussion. My focus will be primarily on 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 railway. Ar will will be on railway architecture alone. Let me first of all mention how I got interested in, uh, in, in, the, in the topic. Uh, my interest developed because at one stage I was in the railway board where one of my many subjects that I looked after was heritage. And one fine day I was asked to attend a meeting of UNESCO in China where the proposal for the Chhatrapati Shivaji terminal in Bombay was to be considered for a grant of uh, World Heritage uh, Site status. And that really got me going because I, I looked at the original plans, which fortunately were available of Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminal, some of the um, uh, correspondence, some nitty gritty details about, uh, about the building. And once that got World Heritage status, uh, I, I have been a student of history. And I have uh, had an interest in architecture, although it was a very casual interest. I have got more and more interested in, in, in railway buildings. The second reason is, was the realization that of the public buildings in India, the maximum number of footfalls are at a railway station. There is no comparison between any other public or in fact private building which has so many so many footfalls and uh, and these people have used these same station buildings over six or seven generations now i mean if you look at bangalore bangalore city station would have been used by several generations um, um, bangalore cantonment is e even older that was the point number two point number three is we the rail you know for the the british ruled india for 200 years and in India, we have 30 UNESCO World Heritage Sites. There are three sites which relate to the British colonial period. One is Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminal. The second are the Mountain Railways of India. And the third is the, is the Victorian Gothic um, uh, portion of, of Bombay along with the Art Deco buildings uh, in, in Mumbai. And that, and, and that ensemble also has another railway building, which is the Bombay Western Railway headquarters, the BBNCI general offices. So you can say the, the, uh, for, for the 200 year period that the British ruled in India, railways in terms of heritage has played an important role. So I will now get to my presentation. It's the longest presentation. Let's see uh, uh, how much of I, it I can cover, but it will give you an idea of what is uh, um, it will give you an idea of railway architecture. So uh, the theme is basically buildings of the Raj because uh, 1853 to 1953 was when uh, we had company railways in India. Um, 
uh, these are the actual chapters of the book which I shall try and cover very briefly, giving a few examples of uh, each category. The first few components really relate to the evolution of uh, different styles of architecture on the railways. They followed developments that were taking place elsewhere in the world and in India uh, in a sort of time sequence. Classical revival, uh, Romanesque revival, Gothic revival, they came in this, in this sequence. And they came in this sequence because in Britain, similar developments were taking place. Now let's look at classical revival architecture. Classical architecture was the architecture of ancient Greece and Rome. Um, uh, uh, and these are the periods in history, 700 BC to 30, uh, to 30 BC was the Greek, 509 BC to 476 AD was Roman. There are three Greek orders, Doric, Ionic and Corinthian, and two uh, Roman orders, Tuscan and, Com and Composite. Now, the Greek order depends on their capital. The capital is the top portion of a column. So you can see these are the shapes that evolved, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have uh, a typical temple structure where you have columns and a horizontal component supported by the columns called the entablature and you have a pediment, the triangular portion on top. Uh, there is a fairly complex uh, 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 terminology regarding each uh, component. I will not go into details, but each component has a name and there are defined proportions uh, for the basic design. As was mentioned, one of the finest buildings that we have belonging to this classic revival stage was the BNR House, Bengal Nagpur Railway House, which was the resident of the agent of the Bengal Nagpur Railway in uh, Calcutta. Uh, it is Doric, it belongs to the Doric order. It is located in an area called Garden Reach, where in the middle of the 19th century, the, the sort of uh, the famous, the rich and famous people stayed. This building was built in the 1840s. Um, uh, it was designed by a city magistrate called C.K. Robinson, who designed many other buildings. It was uh, the residence of Sir Lawrence Speed, who was the Chief Justice of India at the time. And later, by Wajid Ali Shah, when he was exiled to uh, Calcutta from Lucknow, and he uh, resided in the house for a substantial portion of time. He later built another, another, another building in the same area, uh, but he had his entire family residing close by. Another example is the Royapuram station in Madras, built in 1856, probably the oldest large station in India. Uh, this is called quasi-classic because it is a mixture of uh, various components of classical architecture. Uh, you can see these ionic columns. This is the office complex of the Madras Railway. And further down, you had the railway station. It is in very bad shape at the moment. Um, and uh, uh, very little effort is being made to preserve it. But court orders and heritage uh, enthusiasts have been trying to save it. So the old building still survives. The station building, the office complex has gone. Another example is uh, the, the headquarters of the Awadh and Rohilkhand Railway in Lucknow. This is, whereas uh, the previous buildings were Greek, this is uh, Roman. You can see there are the Roman arch uh, in, in this building. And uh, you can see pilasters. The column in between the arch is merely a decorative element. And you can see these small pediments on top of the windows. And in the central bay, uh, there is a, 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 a attractive uh, pediment supported by columns and a small entablature. This photo is of 1874. The building has been modified, but retained some of its features. 
we now come to another school of architecture called Romanesque Revival. The word Romanesque is, is, is used because it has these rounded Roman arches. The main characteristics of these, which are derived from uh, European churches, were thick walls uh, of brick or stone, so it was a heavy structure. Uh, uh, you had Roman arches and arcades, pyramidical or conical uh, roofs, sometimes alternate pair and coral arrangement, a particular type of a corbel, uh, uh, sorry, a, a capital called the cushion or scalloped capital. It had blind arcades and uh, uh, very symmetrical layouts. So basically, this was uh, um, uh, the in uh, in the tenth and eleventh centuries was the period of Romanesque architecture, which was revived again in the nineteenth century. Now, this is the best example in India is Madras Central. Madras Central uh, uh, has thick walls, has rounded arches, decorative arcades conspicuous stars and if you see the uh, these are the small corbel table consisting of a series of arches um, which is typical of uh, of romanesque architecture and you can see this uh, uh, this uh, this is the capital this is again a typical capital used in uh, Romanesque architecture. It has fine moldings. There is an interesting story about the chief architect who designed it. Uh, there was a person that the Madras Railway engaged called Robert Fellows Chisholm, who became a very famous architect in India later on in a different style of architecture. And there was a big dispute between him and the, and the Madras Railway because at that time, 7.5% was the fee of an architect. Now, uh, Chisholm had only been recruited for a limited portion of the job, but he claimed that he virtually did the entire building. And the Madras Railway gave him only 2% of the total cost, uh, whereas he was demanding 5, the full uh, amount being 7.5. So it's an interesting story. And I saw the original correspondence in the archives, in Tam Tamil Nadu archives. But it's an extremely fine building. Romanesque. Another example, this is Agra Fort Station, originally a meter gauge station, built by the Rajputana uh, State Railway in uh, 1881. You have stone masonry, towers, Roman arches, rounded arches, blind arcade. So this is the blind arcade. That means there is, you can't go through it. It's, it's blocked. Uh, and corbels below the cornice. Corbels below the cornice. Although this is a fine building, it is overshadowed by two magnificent structures on both sides. On one side is the Agra Fort, which is you can see on the right. And on the left is a is a, this foot over bridge leads to a mosque, uh, which was built by Shah Jahan's uh, daughter. And uh, uh, of course, the fort is a world heritage site, but uh, uh, this is a fine building, but overshadowed by these two excellent uh, Mughal structures. Howrah Station, built in 1906-1907, also has Romanesque features. There are these eight towers with wide eaves, uh, thick walls, domes, some of them with spikes, uh, clustered window openings. Um, so it has Romanesque features. It was built by a, a, a architect known as Halse Ricardo, who was a relative of Ricardo, who was a famous e economist. Um, but uh, uh, Howrah is an example of the sort of whims whimsy of British architects because they experimented. So this, to my mind, is an experimental design of an architect who was fam famous for another type of uh, architecture called the Arts and Crafts School of Architecture. We now come to Gothic uh, revival. 
Gothic revival uh, followed Romanesque, but there were differences. There was instead of the Roman arch, they used the pointed arch. Um, uh, uh, it had thin walls, not thick walls. Thin walls, stained glass windows, flying buttresses, ribbed vaults. Towers, spires, pinnacles, and we'll have a look at some of these components, what they look like. Um, just to give you an idea, this is a spire. These are spires. These are pinnacles. This is a flying buttress because the walls were thin, they required support. So you had flying buttresses. You had these uh, gargoyles in all kinds of shapes, normally animal shapes. Um, you had a gables with crockets these small uh, structures here and you had these lancet windows and these are lancet stained glass windows so see these are some typical features of gothic architecture which was heading for the sky and our finest building is this this is a painting of the chhatrapati shivaji terminal victoria terminus and this painting was made before the building was constructed by an art uh, by an uh, artist uh, called uh, Haig. Um, so this was how it was initially conceptualized and when it came up it was uh, very much similar. Some details about this, I'll spend a little more time on this. Uh, it was built between 1878 and 1887. The architect was Frederick William Stevens who was a, who was a government architect in Bombay. He went to Britain to study various buildings and stations before he actually submitted his design. Uh, it has all the hallmarks of Gothic uh, revival uh, architecture, spires, turrets, crockets, gargoyles, etc. Um, well, there was only one main difference. That is, you never have a door on a Gothic building, whereas Frederick William Stevens decided to put a ribbed masonry octagonal dome on this particular uh, building. Um, I'm also mentioning that, that it has a lot of ornamentation, which is sort of the influence of Hindu temples. Now, that ornamentation was done by Bombay School of Art, where Rudyard Kipling's father was the main sort of uh, guide. Some of the details, these are the capitals of the columns. You can see different types of arcades and there are several design, very detailed ornamentation. The tympana of an arch with a peacock. And this is, the, this is a, a gargoyle in the shape of a crocodile. The finest room of the of the uh, of this building is what is known as the star chamber, because it has a light blue colored uh, roof with uh, stars on it. It is the main booking and reservation office of the of the, of, of of Central Railway today. Um, and what you have on the right is uh, the looking at the dome from the bottom. Uh, this structure is called a squinch. A squinch is, helps you trans transition from, uh, this is actually the stairwell, from, the, from, a four, from four walls to an octagonal uh, shape. So squinches were there, have been there in mosques and various types of buildings. But this is a particularly uh, well-designed and very attractive uh, squinch. Now, the Western Railway headquarters in Bombay, uh, the BBNCI general offices, were also designed by the same architect, Stevens. But since they were not as well off as the, as the GIP Railway, the, the, uh, what, is, what is Central Railway today, they went in for a much plainer uh, building. But the architect again experimented and he gave a very strong justification to the BBNCI for it. He replaced spires with domes. 
It is still a Gothic building, but he decided to replace spires with domes. And uh, uh, it turned out to be a, a very attractive uh, thing. But as, I, as I'm mentioning, British architects constantly experimented. The building was opened in 1899. This is the original Jabalpur station. The line, you know, the Central Railway, the GIPR, the Great Indian Peninsula Railway and the East Indian Railway lines linked up at Jabalpur in 1870. There was a very big ceremony that was held there. Uh, the, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh was there, the uh, Viceroy was there, judges, Maharajas, all kinds of people. And this building, which came up later, is a, is a, is a, is again a, a gothic structure you can see these uh, pinnacles you can see buttresses although they are not flying buttresses they are buttresses you see paired columns you see these small gargoyles you see these are gar gargoyles so very strongly influenced pointed arches pointed arches so this is a, a, a another example of gothic revival in at a smaller station building and of course, uh, this station was built at the time when Jules Verne uh, wrote his famous Round the World in 80 Days. And there is an interesting story of, uh, of Passepartout and Phileas Fogg rescuing a Parsi princess married to the Maharaja of Bundelkhand. Um, this is another example of, you know, uh, a, a gothic building. It is the old Kulava station. It doesn't exist anymore. It was closed in 1930. But here again, you can see it has got sort of uh, heading for the skies, lancet windows, uh, pointed arch, turrets, uh, gar gargoyles, and a general emphasis on the vertical. Unfortunately, the station had to be closed down in 1930 because there were other plans. We now come to Indo-Saracenic architecture. Um, uh, there was an interesting debate in India uh, whether the British, amongst British architects, whether they should follow European styles or adopt Indian styles with, in, in order to sort of impress the local uh, population. Uh, a leading uh, proponent for uh, the Indian style for getting in Indian architecture was a, a person known as Emerson. Um, it, so Indo-Saracenic Indo architecture was a sort of a combination of, uh, of some Western techniques, but basically borrowed from Indian Islamic and Hindu architecture. So you have bulbous tombs, you have cusped arches, these are cusped arches. You have chajjas, which are extended eaves. Um, this is a chajja. Uh, you have jarokas or ha harem windows. Um, you have minarets and you have very delicate stone openwork screens. A good example of this, uh, one of the best examples is, is Egmore Station in Chennai. Um, uh, it was, uh, you can see the brackets, you can see these domes on a, it's, these are stylized domes, rectangular base, um, brackets borrowed from South Indian uh, architecture and you have these small arches. So it's a very fine building and the interior was also very elaborate. Uh, with these columns and and, uh, and so on. Another example is Kachiguda Station, designed by Vincent Esch, who was a railway architect. As a young man, he joined the Bengal Nagpur Railway. In uh, 1910 or so, there was a big uh, uh, flood in Hyderabad, followed by uh, uh, the plague. And the city was in bad shape. So the Nizam decided to set up an urban improvement board. And he engaged the services of Vincent Desch to design three different buildings, a school, a hospital, and a railway station. Now you can see he, he has uh, 
uh, got these Indo-Saracenic domes, brackets again from South Indian uh, architecture, grills, Vijayanagar style brackets, this two-tire grill on the in the portico. Uh, and he himself described the word Indo-Saracenic had not come into vogue. <coughs> And he described it as Mughal Saracenic, a very attractive building <laughs> and has won a number of heritage awards locally in Hyderabad. Another fine Indo-Saracenic building was uh, uh, the Lucknow station, Charbagh station, <coughs> with very prominent uh, domes and pavilions below them. Architect John Hanneman, it has a beautiful central hall well lit now with natural light coming in and uh, and they are going to rebuild it i hope they retain some of its old features it's a it's a very fine building <coughs> sorry uh, uh, another station was kanpur it has a very attractive uh, ribbed elongated uh, uh, dome it has this recessed kind of arches, uh, very good in the tympanum. It has got these screens, uh, which sort of protect you from the sun. So again, another attractive uh, Indo-Saracenic building, which came up in 1930. And this was perhaps the last Indo-Saracenic building uh, built uh, in India. Coming to the princely states, they continued to, they also followed the Indo-Saracenic uh, designs. This is a remarkable saloon siding in Alwar. It was built by the Maharaja of Alwar. It was designed by a person called Tikaram, who was the chief draftsman of the Rajputana Malwa Railway. So after retirement, he took up this assignment and, and produced this beautiful building. It has a magnificent rooftop pavilion built in the Bangla style. Bangla style are these extended eaves in this curved shape. It had separate uh, sort of resting areas for the Zanana ladies uh, and gentlemen. It had enclosed courtyards on both mm -hmm. sides and a very attractive cust arch entrance gate. Uh, extremely fine uh, small station for exclusive use of the Maharaja of Alwar. This is the Morvi station. Morvi was, uh, you know, the Thakur Sahibs who later became Maharajas of Morvi were great builders. They built palaces, they built secretariats. They built that suspension bridge which recently collapsed and a, lo a lot of life, were, a lo many lives were lost. Um, uh, so it was a beautiful city when I was a young railway officer. I would often go there in a narrow gauge saloon. And uh, it was uh, a very charming city uh, with this beautiful station, a very large station with hardly any passengers on it. So you can see the handsome clock tower, attractive domes. You can see the cornice at all levels. You have these harem windows or uh, corner pavilions and a whole lot of uh, open work screens, a very fine building. And I hope it, 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 it is preserved, although there is very little railway traffic there at the moment. Another one of, this is Rampur, the, the Nawab of Rampur. He built uh, a station exclusive, exclusively for himself. Again, this is the saloon siding where he and his family would board the train. This is the uh, sort of the, the resting areas, Zanana, separate Zanana. And this is a look at the building from a, a, a little distance. So the Maharajas also had these their own, uh, you know, uh, sidings. But all Maharajas didn't build uh, Indo-Saracenic Saracenic style. This is, this was built by the Mysore Railway, this is Mysore Station, such a charming station with this sort of rustic calure. Um, believe it or not, the station today is exactly the same building. Only thing it is covered by uh, these platform sheds. On the other side, they have built uh, 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 
you know buildings with uh, columns continuous columns perhaps trying to go classical revival on the other side there's a double storied building on this side but this is a really charming building um uh, which existed i do not know how much ro uh, role the maharaja had to play because this was the time you know mysore state was ruled directly by the british for a period and this was about the time of something called the rendition when the maharaja was <laughs> was brought back so it is probably british planners engaged by the mysore state railway who designed that station we now come to the early 20th century you know so far people have been looking back they were looking at the greeks and romans and medieval ages big change took place in the new century you know there was innovation something called modernism which means they got in new materials reinforced concrete steel frames ribbon windows horizontal lines flat roofs very little ornamentation um externally white or neutral shades um uh, in the west the main proponents of modernism were walter gropius le corbusier lloyd wright and about the same time you got the art deco uh, of which bombay is now famous and as far as railway buildings are concerned we suddenly had a very minimalistic design features for our buildings an example this is nagpur station inaugurated in 1925 um uh, has some old classical features but very plain uh, uh station big arcade on the ground floor ample accommodation it was planned on a larger scale but because of the economy that was uh, thrust upon the railways because of world war 1 it was uh, smaller than what was initially envisaged similarly you have bombay central station built uh, by claude batley in the uh, 1930s and you can see these horizontal row of buildings uh, is a distinctive central arch uh, uh, a large circulating hall which was very well ventilated and lit inside um and uh, you can see these vertical panels which have some art deco influences this is the mumbai main line station uh, at vt it somehow doesn't fit in with the old uh, gothic masterpiece but since architectural styles were changing it has the same pattern uh, plain walls rows of windows and inside also it was remarkable you can see this uh, concrete beams uh, coming in columns and beams uh, this is the dining hall the restaurant of the station similarly you get uh, uh, trichinopoly station built in 1935 again white uh, white washed station with uh, with the extended arcades on both sides and uh, central bay with larger uh, arches the station had subways instead of fobs excellent uh, amenities and still serves the the city of trichy today now let's look at different categories of buildings uh, we will look at general offices of uh, company railways now this building on the right this is the eastern railway headquarters formerly the east indian railway headquarters it is a building which was uh, uh, described as an italian palazzo it is designed on something called the farnese palace in rome For, because of this conspicuous corn, uh, cornice the cornice on the original building in in rome the farnese palace was designed by michael angelo who was engaged specifically for this purpose by the that, that farnes palace was owned by one of those very rich popes uh, a, a person who eventually became pope um so you have this beautiful building designed by the roskel bains who again joined east indian railway as a young young man 
grew to become a very famous architect, also designed a number of other buildings, not only in Calcutta, elsewhere. If you know of New Market in Calcutta, that was designed by Roscoe Baines. And there are buildings in Ilhabad which were designed by him. This is, these are the head offices of uh, the Bengal Nagpur Railway, now Southeastern Railway. Um, uh, architect is the same as for Hyderabad Beta Gage, Vincent Esch. He joined uh, Southeastern Railway as a young man. And uh, uh, this was the original design with a lot of classical features. But towards the end, he himself modified it by providing these bangla style eaves, by providing uh, uh, these uh, buttresses and putting in sort of trying to put in Indian elements and at the end of it he said this is an Indo-Saracenic building which it is clearly not. It is predominantly uh, uh, a classical revival, a revival building. The staircase inside has got stylized classical ionic columns, it has beautiful banisters uh, and so on. But uh, Vincent H. was again a, 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 a well-known architect. He was the supervising architect for the Victoria Memorial, which is another fine building in, 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 uh, in Calcutta. Emerson was the architect of Victoria Memorial and Vincent H. became the supervising architect for that particular building. So this is the BNR headquarters. We now look at Southern Railway headquarters. Again, this is Indo-Saracenic. You can see these domes. You can see these uh, uh, designer sort of uh, pavilions. What we what in conventional Indo-Saracenic was a was a pavilion. Or was a you would normally have an umbrella shaped uh, dome on top, but this is stylized. You can see these moldings. Um, yeah, uh, and other features. It was designed by a person called Grayson, who was the actual uh, architect of uh, the Madras Railway. Um, this is the Southern Maratha Railway headquarters at Dharwar. Uh, Southern Maratha Railway and Madras Railway merged to form the Madras and Southern Maratha Railway. This building in 1908 was handed over to a college, an arts college in Dharwar. It is still uh, a, a college and very recently uh, uh, they engaged the services of the railways to actually restore the working of this particular clock uh, and some other minor restoration works that were carried out. Only on this, earlier this year they engaged uh, the Southwestern Railway for that purpose. Again, uh, not a very outstanding building, but it has this Belvedere feature, which is fine. Uh, it has these unique uh, sort of uh, twin columns. It has uh, interesting uh, openings uh, in sort of diamond shape on one floor, round on the other. I think uh, this is also another fine building, although acquired after independence, but since it is, since it is the headquarters of Northern Railway, I thought I'd mentioned it. It is one of the few buildings which Edwin Latians himself designed for the Maharaja of Baroda. Um, uh, so you have classical features and you get the dome, which is Indian. Uh, you get these, uh, these jalis, which are again borrowed from Indian. Urns are somehow uh, typical of uh, classical, uh, uh, neoclassical buildings. Uh, it had it had two two entrances, one here and one here. One was the Maharaja's portion, the other was the Maharani's portion. The general manager of the railway, and I happened to be the general manager once upon a time, was the Maharaja's bedroom, and the secretary sat, sat in the in the in the Maharani's uh, sorry uh, dressing room. So a, a very fine building. Unfortunately, we have not been able to maintain it to the standards that good conservation merits. I now come to a few other buildings which do not fall into any specific category, but I'll just mention them. This is Ahmedabad station. Uh, the line was opened in 1863. 
and why I'm mentioning it are these beautiful uh, uh, 16th century minarets. These minarets exist on both sides of the station and on one side you shake one minaret, the other also shakes. So they are called the shaking minarets. And so it is a modern technology, 19th century, century technology meeting uh, minarets of the 16th century. Um, the station itself was, was a big shed with a double discharge facility. But the area next to the station is today a World Heritage Site. It is the fortified city of Ahmedabad, uh, which uh, recently gained, recently means in the last four or five years, became a, a World Heritage Site. This is Dehradun Station, another charming station with the Masuri Hills as the backdrop. There's a very old photograph uh, of this uh, building. Um, a good uh, stone masonry facade with variegated uh, sort of use of stones, corner coins, tall chimneys, and so on. A, 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 a much smaller station, but still an attractive station. Still in use. I think all of you would be familiar with this. This is Bangalore station. Original meter gauge station. You can see meter gauge coaches. And on the right, I went to Bangalore some, some years back and, uh, and I, I took this photograph and I was surprised to find the building still exists. This is the traffic manager, used to be the traffic manager's office. And this um, uh, these ridge and furrow shed is still there. And I'm glad it has been preserved by, uh, by, by, by the railway. It's something that still survives. This is Sialda Station. Sialda was built in the 1860s. Architect Walter Granville, who became the, uh, the architect for the main architect for the government. Um, he again joined the railways as a young architect. He joined the uh, East Bengal Railway and uh, later rose to design the, the High Court in, in Calcutta designed the post office building, which are some of the finest buildings in Calcutta. But he also did Sialda Station in his early days. It was then described as an Italian style of oriental structure. This photograph that I have on the left is, belongs in the 1860s. What has been changing is the front facade. So this was the facade as it was around during the Second World War. Um, it, uh, it is supposed to have been based on the design of Nineveh and Khursabad, that is the main waiting hall. Uh, and it had high level openings um, uh, for ventilation. An interesting uh, building with a great history. This is a building in Delhi. It is called Fraser Koti, where the Northern Railway Construction Office is located. It has a fascinating history. This was the site of a palace which belonged to Ali Mardan Khan. He was a Kurdish nobleman or a lieutenant of Shah Jahan, Emperor Shah Jahan. His palace used to be here. Although the palace on top has gone, underground there are three floors. And uh, there are huge rooms underground with three secret tunnels going to the uh, Red Fort in Delhi. One going toward the river and I think one was for water. Um, later on, when the British came to India, they had a resident in Delhi because the Mughal emperor, uh, who had lost power, but still he was emperor, he was based in Delhi, and you had a resident uh, who was attached to him. Now, William Fraser was an assistant uh, um, uh, resident in the beginning, later became the resident. He was what is described as a white Mughal, that means he was a a person who, who adopted Indian clothes, he married, uh, uh, he had Indian wife, he had Indian concubines, he was a, a, a fan of Ghalib, right? So uh, he spoke fluent Persian. So he stayed in this, uh, in this building. Unfortunately, he was murdered in the 1830s. Now this building was built uh, in the, about that time uh, by a person who was then Major Robert Smith. He had a particular style of architecture and he built this bungalow, which was the koti of the resident. 
the dome came in much later but it's a it's got a very unusual pointed arch uh, and he later on designed uh, hotels and and uh, and residences in the uk which you can make out straight away is is the style that he pursued but this is a, a wonderful building a heritage site today and the railway is trying to preserve it to best of its ability um i had a fascination for pitched roofs and gables so i put in a, a chapter on that uh, on the right you have some terminology this is a gable roof this is a hip roof this is a cross hip roof where you have sort of uh, a, a slope on all sides this is a cross gabled uh, building this is a, a a gablet roof where you have the small portion on top which is open but with the hip feature and the remaining portion and this is a dutch gable where you have uh, sort of curved features but uh, the wall is on the outside of the gable whereas here it is the inside wall is exposed um such uh, dutch gables are found uh, very common in south africa and of course in in holland this is an extremely fine building built in 1860s late 1860s built as originally as the elphinstone college in bombay uh it has a very distinctive roof layout um uh, a central tower and all the features that i have mentioned there of a pitched roof you find here and all types of gables are are, are available here when it became uh, when it when when elphinstone college grew they shifted and a victoria jubilee technical institute came into this building it was later taken over by the gip railway for a, as a hospital in uh, 1924 and there was a big tussle for opening a hospital here between the railway board and gip railway which is a story by itself i won't uh, spend time on that here and they built it primarily to avoid they built a hospital because the railway staff was going to private doctors and getting medical certificates so in order to avoid something they called malingering they built they opened this hospital this is another very attractive building with the dutch gables at bilaspur this is building still there but its beauty is lost because a a, a platform shed has come on this side it has very fine verge verge boards are these boards and some of the finest verge boards in india i think you have in bangalore there are a large number of buildings still in bangalore which have beautiful bar they are also called barge boards it had these lead diamond windows uh attractive cresting on top and moldings above the above the doors and uh, windows this is again in karnataka mangaluru station uh, building uh, the building still stands but its beauty is all lost um, this is the it was as it was in 1907 when the station opened um, uh, this is uh, the platform site again ridge and furrow arrangement for the station shed the station was opened by the madras railway and then transferred in 1908 to the south indian railway and were managed by them till independence this is again an extremely attractive building this was in quetta which is in pakistan now steep pitched roofs slate tiles these are called jerkin head or clipped gables you can see these uh extremely attractive fascia and uh, finials unfortunately the building was destroyed in a very severe earthquake which hit quetta and 1935 everything in that city went and this is quilon station again a uh, very attractive uh, station building to my mind um it had big shaped dormers and gambler you see these uh these are dormers a window a, a, a window opening from the slope of a roof is called a dormer um but this is not western style 
this is pure kerala architecture and kerala ka architecture is unique uh, they don't use any metal, metal joints in these rooftops it's all woodwork and uh, uh, i wish they had been able to preserve it but uh, this building which opened in 1903 was the terminus of the south indian railway in uh, travancore state and it continued to be the terminus uh, and the only station main station in travancore until uh, for several years until a line was extended to trivandrum i'll just show you a build, some buildings of the mountain railways of india and then i think we can stop because we have to leave time for questions this is uh, the darjeeling himalayan railway the world heritage status is not for buildings it is how you tackle the gradients is the innovation so they innovated by putting in loops and something called zigzags where you back on to a, a a rising slope and then you come down and with the momentum you climb up the slope in front of you this is uh, uh, the nilgiri mountain railway also a world heritage site some very attractive uh, uh, pitched roof buildings but they had something called the alternate abt stands for alternate biting teeth system or tooth system where they had a rail in the middle of the uh, of the track with teeth and uh, so you had a virtually a cog and wheel arrangement for ensuring the train doesn't slip back this is the kalka shimla railway where uh, again you have attractive buildings with these uh, um, a ridge and furrow roof arrangement depending on the size of the station this is a large station bro and they tackled the gradient by tunnels there there were originally 107 tunnels there are now 103 tunnels on this route and a large number of gallery bridges so these are stone arch bridges linking one spur to another we now come to company styles you know each company adopted its own style east indian railway had these uh, what we call uh, uh, a single shed over a one platform the north western railway built sheds uh, um, of this sort of uh, half barrel shaped sections uh, covering two platform lines you had the rajputana malwa railway amdavad section which built domes on all their small stations big and small you had domes abu road sitpur sojat this is the delhi ambala kalka railway which had a very attractive uh, stations with these small gablets and uh, this very fine iron fencing which still exists at many of these stations training institutions and bungalows um, the original this is the indian military academy today but the indian military academy today was the first railway staff college and its central hall used to be the model room we handed it over to the army because during the great depression of 1929 30 the railway went broke and they sacrificed training this is the current uh, Uh, railway staff college which is uh, in the pratap vilas palace in baroda this is a renaissance style uh, palace building built by uh, the architect was the son of frederick uh, william stevens who did the vt and bbnci building so his son designed this building and again a very fine building through which every railway officer passes then there are railway institutes and they came this was sort of gothic influence this is uh, at jamalpur you have uh, classical influence and there are some romanesque features here with these towers and and some indian elements with the domes bungalows are also you know there are fascinating uh, variety of bungalows on the railways this is an 1862 photograph of a bungalow in jamalpur it is called the first bungalow in jamalpur so you can see it is how it has evolved since then this is a rather crude structure 
uh, it then went on i mean this was the loco uh, superintendent's uh, residence in, in jamalpur again he built a put up a platform shed on his roof uh, this is a draftsman house in kadakpur this is the engineer's residence in asansol chief mechanical engineer's residence in uh, kadakpur and this is a bungalow in uh, indore not indore mau close to indore and uh, this is what was eventually bkk became a typical railway bungalow in most cities in india coming post independence you have bangalore city station here you have amdavad station this was with with uh, a typical uh, in order to break the sunlight they had these kind of structures outside um uh, but later on as the british were uh, whimsical so were indians so we built a katak station at like a fort and we borrowed the palace design for uh, at agartala so the station design is based on the agartala tripura maharaja's palace which is a fine building but uh you you see this is the headquarters in bhubaneswar when new railways were created they built fine buildings and this is again the quirky paint structure of bombay central i mean claude batley who was the original architect must be turning in his grave when he sees this kind of paint on the building uh but this is the future these are this is the things to come this is habib khan station near bhopal firstly its name has since been changed to rani kamlapati it was built uh, new and uh, the new stations are going to be glass aluminum and steel um i stop here time for questions the baikula railway station recently got the unesco award for the for conservation uh and it's a comment by arunesh and he says it's good to hear in the context of preserving railway heritage baikula yeah the building that i showed is not baikula station the building i showed was baikula hospital i think may not have mentioned it it is the central railway hospital at baikula but i think uh, you are right there is an effort being made to uh, preserve and conserve baikula station railway station also So in fact, the Baikala uh, renovation has been completed, and we had an article on this in one of our magazines about two issues back. Um, Arunesh also asks if there is documentation of the building diagrams available somewhere, and if your book is uh, online. Um, uh, the book is not online. Um, that is really up to the publisher. The book is available on Amazon. but your uh, first part of the question was what i forgot uh, the building uh, diagrams available yeah the di- diagrams are in many cases available we found in uh, lucknow it was available for mumbai vt it was available. they are not available in my book but in many stations the original drawings are available see unfortunately but, uh, none I of these drawings an effort needs to be made to catalog them to preserve them and so on Yes, they are not in one place. You'll find them at different places. Uh, Vinod, is there any or any steps being taken to preserve Lucknow Chabag from uh, the developers' um, demolition? What I'm told, what I'm told is the station will be redeveloped. but they will try and retain some of its uh, present features that's what i heard but that will be impossible by then i don't know <laughs> <laughs> no but they have done it you know they have done it if you look at st pancras in england which is the high speed uh, uh, terminus now uh, they have been able to i mean if you look at the building from outside it is exactly the same but they have transformed it inside so i think the way is best suited to answer that question but i think it's possible to conserve all buildings and, and still modernize them from the inside yes 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, that depends if the railway has that will, you know. I mean, sometimes I find that somehow the way the, way the railway wants to project railway stations as airport or even outer space stations, they want to use a very futuristic uh, 24th century design uh, for even 18th, 19th century building, this beautiful building that you're showing. So I think we need to also create that will for the railways to really see merit in their own heritage, to continue it, take it along. And I think that is what I was also going to ask, actually, but you know, I had already asked that. Why do you think that there is that thing? Because like, you know, we've heard also uh, several stories of even some of the locomotives being sold as scrap. Uh, there are some examples of the first uh, steam engines not being, I mean, there were three and there were now they were all sold for scrap. Like even the Curzon Bridge uh, close to Calcutta uh, seems to be threatened. The, there is no sort of um, clarity on what will happen to the Lohe Kapul once the new bridge is constructed. So there is this always this fear of us losing this valuable heritage, even when you have a heritage department, even when you have this long legacy of heritage within the railways. Why and how can we correct it? Yeah, I, I, actually the railways, because, uh, you know, railway men have been working, railway men are working with steam locomotives. So, uh, perhaps there was not that so much concern for conservation. And since the railways were in uh, sort of difficult e uh, economic position, they sort of sold it for, sold them for scrap, really. But now there is an effort being made. You mentioned a bridge in Calcutta. Um, the One of the bridges in Calcutta, because of the effort made by some members who are also members of our society, the East Indian Railway has, the Eastern Railway has agreed to preserve the old girders and put them on the side. Um, uh, uh, JL Singh will correct me, I don't know. I think they have succeeded in that. That's effort. right. This is the what is now called the, uh, Vivekananda, the of, Vivekananda. Present name is Vivekananda. Uh, old name I. Victoria Bridge. Bridge. It used to be called the Jubilee Bridge. Yeah, Jubilee Bridge. Or the it was opened the same year when Queen Victoria completed 50 years or something like that. But perhaps I could mention here also we have another society which. Um, I know that Dino is a member of, as well as me, called the Indian Steam Railway Society. And uh, we have been, had some successes. A particular one is the renovation of the uh, Rirati shed um, mm. and uh, the maintenance of steam engines there. And um, uh, it's uh, very um, popular and very um, worthwhile. Uh, uh, steam venture. Uh, there are a few questions uh, to Mr. Singh asking about how does one become a member of the Railway Enthusiast Society? Uh, please send me a WhatsApp message. I can give the number here. It is 813 589. I'll repeat the number 813-0-111-589. Please send me a WhatsApp message and I'll give you all details. Uh, uh, I, I should warn you, I think you should be uh, prepared for <laughs> all sorts of messages also. That's <laughs> okay. That's okay. <laughs> good mornings and good evenings. Uh, I think this question is for all four of you. Uh, Arunesh asks, what is one defining story about Indian Railways heritage that has amazed you? Uh, who's going first on that one? <laughs> so, Mark, would you like to this first? Um, well, I, th I think what, what has um, uh, de amazed me and delighted me is uh, the reawakening of uh, the realization that steam is something uh, which has to be preserved. Um, I, I, I'm really 
pleased about this, and uh, I will just say this, uh, that um, I hope, I really hope, that we will eventually um, evolve a preserved scheme line or two. Mr. Martin, to answer the question. Oh, I, I, I think whatever, what to me, my, my mind is, of course, the more importance of preserving steam is, is uh, I mean, as far as heritage is concerned, when we talk about railways, I talked about buildings. But the, 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 the item that has the most sort of romance about it are steam locomotives. Every child wants to become a steam locomotive driver. So it's important that we, we, uh, we preserve it. But I think the most, most amazing, amazing story have, was when the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway became the a World Heritage Site. And uh, that was a great achievement and the effort does not go to railwaymen alone. These are fans of the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway who reside in, in UK, who reside in Australia, who reside in India, who reside in Canada. And they all jointly put in this effort to get recognition for the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway. After that, there was a follow-up of, you know, uh, including the Kalka Shimla Railway and the uh, uh, Nilgiri Nilgiri. Mountain Railway and Chhatrapati Shivaji Terminal. But I think the pioneering work in uh, preservation or making an effort to preserve was the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway. And so Mark Kali also played a very important role in that. And he has a very close association with that railway because his father was one of its directors. <laughs> he was a director. <laughs> yes. Now, what about the other two? Okay. Oh, sorry. Please, please go ahead. Sir. No, you please go ahead. Well, I just, I mean, I think I will want to talk beyond locomotives and the buildings. For me, the most uh, amazing about heritage is this food. You know, the kind of food you get at every station, and the kind of food you used to get at the railway canteens when we were there. I can still recall the cutlets at uh, Kart Kudam. <laughs> and uh, certain kind of uh, namak wali chai in, uh, in, in near to Ahmedabad. So I think that really has fascinated me. And I think I was really happy to know that uh, the, the Directorate of Heritage and Railways have really started to put, uh, put this food heritage of railways together. And they were perhaps will create a map of the food heritage of railways. I mean, that has really fascinated me. It's, since I was a child. Uh, so. See, there are many amazing stories about railway heritage, but the one that comes to my mind straight away is the one about the tunnel near Baroque station on the Kalka Shibla Railway. Uh, the Baroque is named after a Colonel Baroque, who was the engineer who was building the line in that part of the line. Uh, a tunnel was to be built near Barog. He decided to start building it from both sides. Uh, but unfortunately, his alignment went wrong. Mm -hmm. And when the two sides met, they were not meeting correctly. So he got a reprimand for this and he was fined rupee one, I'm told. He was so upset that he went to the mouth of the tunnel and shot himself. Mm -hmm. uh, the tunnel, old tunnel still exists. And even I believe his grave still exists. A uh, grave still exists. So that is the story of the Baroque tunnel. Of course, then a new tunnel was built later. The one that you crossed now is the longest tunnel on that line. And it is uh, not the original Baroque tunnel which caused his suicide. And it's supposedly haunted by his ghost and people have claimed that. Yeah, all, all such tunnels will always be haunted. <laughs> there are several stories. Hmm. And it used to be a good place to have breakfast. So I don't think it's quite so good. Baroque station is still very good. It's yes. still very good for breakfast. Mm. Uh, the mushroom soup, uh, the almond soup there. Yes, yes, yes. So see, each station is even associated with particular food. 
we have unfortunately run out of uh, time uh, but maybe we have time for one question and one comment uh, mr murli ms says uh, the southern railway uh, headquarters inaugurated by ad willingdon on december 11 1922 featured in this talk uh, stands which stands next to madras central station turns 100 on december 11th and uh, there's a heritage walk plan on that day uh, with the southern railways chipping in so i think that might be a good uh, tidbit of information for uh, all the railway enthusiasts in chennai for the coming week and uh, Mira Murthy asks if uh, railway saloons still are in use, uh, are they not heritage items? And if, uh, which is the most interesting one? I can try to answer that because we've been working on the saloon for some time. I mean, maybe Mr. Mathurji and uh, Mr. Singh can also chip in. Well, most of them are really not in use because we've had the gate conversion and most of the saloons were off. Uh, narrow gauge or meter gauge and the old palace on wheels was actually a combination of all the principalities uh, saloons and that was the most beautiful experience but now there is a new train called the palace on wheels these are not original saloons unfortunately we, most of these saloons are dying a slow death for the last 10 years in the backyard of the national rail museum so slowly, slowly, the kind of beautiful decorations and some of the saloons were even painted. And I remember um, uh, I traveled in the, the one saloon of the Kapoorthala Maharaja and, and they had uh, double bedroom saloons in the sense that it, it, it did not have uh, a single beds or like a typical uh, bed arrangement. It was actually like a bedroom with a double bed. So... But they are there, but unfortunately, they are not been uh, looked after. We've even said that it can be made into even a heritage hotel and it can fund for itself. So I hope some efforts will be done to save them before they're completely lost. Just to add, add to that, uh, yeah, the original Palace on Wheels consisted of saloons which belong to the, many of them belong to the Maharajas. Old, old Maharaja saloons. But with gauge conversion, they had to sort of give way to broad gauge uh, coaches. Saloons as such, these are we, we, the word saloon is not used in the railway. It's called an inspection car. Mm -hmm. And inspection cars are still in use because uh, when railway officers travel, you have to travel in, uh, and you go to many places where there are no rest house uh, houses available. So normally you then use an inspection car to travel from uh, your headquarters to that outstation. So they are in use, but I think their use is declining. Many of these saloons are correct, cur currently available for uh, the public to take on hire if they want to. And as was pointed out by Divey, the old meter gauge question are now uh, saloons of the Palace on Wheels are in the National Rail Museum. And perhaps uh, they do require a little more attention. Do you like I... to add something? No. no I think you've covered I... it all, you know, nothing to add. As I earlier mentioned, we have unfortunately uh, run over time. Uh, is there any closing comments? Well, I'd just like to say that, uh, well, it's a great presentation and it's a wonderful book. And we must hope for more books like this to encourage um, uh, the uh, creation of a real uh, thriving heritage railway lobby. I completely second that. Thank you, Mark. Good. Thank you. This, is, this has been a fascinating uh, presentation and an absolutely lovely way to uh, spend an evening uh, going, taking this journey through these wonderful, wonderful buildings uh, through history. Thank you, Mr. Mato, for all the work that you've done and for this wonderful book. Thank you, Sir Mark, uh, Mr. Singh and Mr. Gupta for your contributions and for being on this panel with us and for making the time.
thanks to the audience who have uh, been watching and uh, for all the lovely questions as well and all i have to say now is thank you and uh, good night everyone and see you all next time thank you good, good night. night thank you good night good night